I actually hey, really Roger like Tim. it for that. Ready? Oh, shame is a prison. It's cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber, and he's come to take my name. Love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. Sound. Gonna rise up out of the ground. There ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. you guys are here it is Pentecost Sunday yeah. okay so tonight we're gonna have a service that's gonna bring all our ch the churches in the community together super exciting 
But we're kicking it off a little early, so if you guys don't know, some of these people uh, don't go to our church and stuff. But <laughs> thankfully and stuff, we are one church, right? Yeah. So uh, this is Tim over here and her over here. They're cool. We're, they're visiting from Yamhill County. Um, yeah. And so uh, are you guys ready to worship some more? Yeah. Okay. <laughs>
love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the ninety-nine. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. abounds in deepest waters your sovereign
and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I am yours, and you are
Isn't it just lovely, that presence? He's our overcomer. He dwells in us and with us and through us. And when we come together and worship him and lift our hands up to him in the house of the Lord, it is pleasant. He calls us to enter into his rest, to not strive on our own, and he empowers us to do it. We just thank you, Lord. We receive. Can you say that to yourself? Lord, I receive. I receive it. Thank you, Lord. I receive it. So good. So, so good. Lord, we just thank you for that opportunity to worship. We thank you for that opportunity to unify in the house of the Lord. Come together. We just give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. We're going to take a minute and get up and greet each other. And if there's still kids up here, they are already downstairs. So if you want to go gather with the kids downstairs. You're welcome to do that. Otherwise, get up and greet each other. Say hi. Introduce you to somebody. Introduce yourself to somebody you don't know.
All right. How about if we come on back to our seats? You can actually stick around after service and visit too. Isn't that neat? We have those options. Okay. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for our kids downstairs. Father God, I do just want to lift up Sunday school. I thank you that we have kids in Sunday school. I really pray that you would just cover the Sunday school this morning with your presence and that the kids will learn and that the teachers will have wisdom and insight as they govern those classes. And we thank you that it would be really good this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Okay, so I have a couple announcements. What is today? Pentecost. And tonight at 6 o'clock here, we're having a community Pentecost service. And I love that we do that because it means that people from other churches that we may not know, we get to connect with and see and say, oh, I see you in town all the time, right? It kind of opens that door to communicate more. So please come to Pentecost service. It looks like the pastor's from the community are working together to do the worship and bring the message. So please come out, 6 o'clock tonight here. Also, yes, it's up here. It's up here. Yes. And then also um, small groups are going to start, and Marty and Dylan Smith are doing a small group on loving your neighbor. And they, I think there's a sign-up sheet right outside on the desk out in the foyer. So uh, please, if you want to check into that, sign up. Also, um, this week, Wednesday night, we're going to start the teaching time for uh, ministry walking, which is fun. We did it last year. It was really good. We kind of did it in the fall, so some of the days weren't so great. But now we've learned, and we're going to do it in the spring. And uh, we'll meet together downstairs and talk about what that looks like on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. And, um, and then the next Wednesday, we get to go out and do it. You do it in, uh, as two or three people. And it's uh, very neat. We encountered a, quite a few neat situations last year for that. So this Thursday. And then June 18th, we have a barbecue, but it didn't give a time. 11 to 1. And it is a community barbecue, and it is happening here, and we're to invite people to it. They don't, they don't have to be churchgoers or believers. Just invite your neighbors or whoever. That's June 18th, 1 to 4. And then uh, just a reminder, we, we have Celebrate Recovery on Friday nights, and then we also have prayer meeting on Wednesday morning, 9.30 to 11, and Saturday night from 6 to 7.30. So please come to that. Pastor, would you like to come up? I would like to come up, yeah. Woo! Hallelujah. Yeah, that's going to be a really fun time. So it's June 18th. It's going to be down in the lower parking lot. Uh, and it's going to be, it's, uh, it's basically a community welcome to summer barbecue. So uh, everybody's invited. We're going to have bounce houses for the kids. We're going to have games and prizes. And we're going to luau a pig. Woo! Have an entire 100 to 110 pound pig. We're going to put it in the ground and cook it underground. And then we're going to eat it. So, yeah, it's going to be 16 hours of, of cooked. It's going to be delicious. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. So please come out. That's going to be a lot of fun. Yes. No, you don't have to bring side dishes. But if you would like to help, eat, like serving or running some of the games, please, uh, uh, I would say talk to me. Email, email me would be the best idea because if you talk to me, if you've noticed, I don't know if you noticed it before, but words that go in my head, they don't stay there for very long. You know what I mean? I, they get kicked out real quick. So email me, and my email address is on the bulletin, okay? So you can email the church. Hey, yeah. Yeah, we're going to bury the pig right out there. Well, not in the, gr on the asphalt, in the grass. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're also going to have hot dogs. We're going to have all beef hot dogs because I know some people don't eat pig. That's fine. All beef hot dogs, but, the, but, but I'm going to eat a pig. So let's, uh, let's pray and get into the word of the Lord this morning. Uh, God, we just thank you so much for your presence, Lord, and for your Holy Spirit. Would you come and be with us, Lord, and, and anoint our ears to hear what you have to say this morning. In your name, Jesus, amen. 
Amen. Well, last weekend, we uh, were missing some of the ladies. I heard it was an amazing time at the women's retreat. Did you guys have fun at the women's retreat last weekend? Yes. Good. We're so excited. We have um, a video of all that, but we're not going to play it today. We're going to play it later uh, in the month. And we really want to encourage uh, ladies to come out for our women's events. Um, they just had a great time, which was awesome. So, well, we're back in our uh, series on First Thessalonians. Uh, the trouble was this morning during worship, God rewrote the first part of my sermon. And so I had, I, start, I ran out of room, so I, like, I had to go sideways, and then I had to go upside down on my thing. So if you see me like going like this on my notes, that's all right. Thankfully, he let me keep the majority of it, so um, that's good. It's always nerve-wracking when he's like, hey, re, you got, I got a whole new thing for you. And you're like, oh, God, do you really want to do that? Um, so let's go. I want to. I want to talk about First Thessalonians. We're, you are, we are going to talk about First Thessalonians, but before we get to that, um, I want to talk about Acts two uh, because today is Pentecost. So would you just in your in your Bible, if you want to just go to First Thessalonians three and put your finger in the in that spot there, if you have a if you have a non digital Bible, and then turn to Acts two with me, and we're going to look for just a second um, at, at this. The Acts, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, is when we hear about Pentecost. Today, like Christy said, is, is when we celebrate Pentecost. Um, and Acts 2 kind of talks about that event uh, as it was originally uh, occurring um, in, in the year 30, 35 or so. Uh, and so we're just going to, I'm just going to read this just a second, okay? So I'm going to read from verses 1 to, let's see how far I'm going to go. I'm guessing I'm going to go to verse 4. Yeah. So it says, when the day of Pentecost came, hey, Pente- day, that's today. Wow. Man, that, that seminary degree is paying for itself. When the day of, I didn't even check that before I said Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them, everyone in that room, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now, I just want to point out just briefly, as a a means of introduction, a couple of things here. The first observation I have is that they were all together in one place, right? And when it says all together in one place, you know, Jesus had a lot of disciples that he hung out with. There was 12 that he especially was close to. But there were other people who hung around and followed him. We have uh, a list of, for example, women. Uh, the women who came to the tomb uh, to anoint his uh, body with oil after he had died. Um, there's a, probably half a dozen women mentioned in the New Testament who would follow him around. There's other guys uh, apart from his disciples who would follow him around. So there were multiple people, not just 12, a group of people that were Jesus followers at this time, um, following him from place to place. And so when it says they were all together in one room, it just doesn't, doesn't mean 12 people. It means multiple people, right? Many people, scores of people actually, together in one place in one house. Different kinds of people. Even the disciples, there was different kinds of people there. There was a zealot. That means he was he was like a, what we would call today a terrorist. I mean, honestly, he wanted to overthrow the government. He was interested in uh, killing Romans and, and destroying supply lines. That's what zealots were. There was a zealot. There was a tax collector. The tax collector worked for the government. Right? What were their conversations like, I wonder? Right? <laughs> right? There were fishermen, you know, people who worked with their hands. There were educated people, Right? All these people together in one place. A diverse group of people together. Um, It's kind of like us today, a little bit. A diverse group of people together. And and as we were worshiping, I heard some of our Native American Christians in the room worshiping uh, in their own own cultural way. And I want to point out something, and that is that diversity is uncomfortable to many of us, right? Uh, if we uh, were all an older congregation, 
We would all want to sing hymns on a Sunday morning, perhaps, right? Maybe not us, maybe not this room, but there are churches where that would be what you would want, right? And young people, when they enter into those situations, they say, this is uncomfortable because I, I'm not used to this style of worship, right? In other churches where you have predominantly young people, you can play the, the new, hip, cool, fast stuff. It's not cool, it's just, that's my age. It's faster paced. And people who are older who walk into those churches often feel like this is a bit too loud, this is a bit too fast, this is not my style of, of worship. How easier is it for churches to become monocultural? One age group, one ethnicity, uh, one political view. Because then the pastor can get up and Man, if we're all conservative, I could preach a conservative message. If we're all liberal, I can preach a liberal message. I don't make anybody upset, right? But when you get diversity and you start bringing people from different cultures and different age groups and different political parties and different ideals and you put them all together, all together in one room, things can get uncomfortable sometimes because we're not all the same, you know. But I think that maybe that is closer to what they were doing here in Acts 2, right? And that's a good thing. That's a really important thing. That's a really wonderful thing. So in the midst of this thing in Acts 2, um, as I've turned the paper sideways, it says that the Holy Spirit came upon these people all together, all these different people in one room, and, he, and, and it says they began to speak in different languages. Now, we are a, a church um, that's a part of a movement that believes that, that that's something that can still happen today, that the Holy Spirit can still move on people and cause them to speak in different languages. Sometimes those languages are languages that we know. Sometimes they're languages that we don't know. Um, but there's nothing in my Bibles that says that that just doesn't happen today. So we do believe that 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 does happen today. But I, what I want to point out, I don't want to focus on that specifically. What I want to focus on is the idea of different languages. Have you ever been in a foreign country that didn't speak the language that you speak? Have you ever, like traveled in Europe or whatever? Um, no, there's two or three of us that have. Yes, is that, oh, good, good. Most of a few, a oh, few. Um, and it is sometimes difficult to communicate with people when you don't speak their language. Am I right? Yeah. And if everyone spoke the same language, it would make things a lot easier to communicate and get things done. So then why is it that when the Holy Spirit falls at Pentecost, the first thing the Holy Spirit does is distribute different languages to people, right? Forces us into places of uncomfortability. Forces us to communicate with each other, even when we're speaking different languages. This is interesting to me. Because what I believe about speaking different languages or speaking in tongues is that it's the Holy Spirit that brings unity between people, even though they're speaking different languages. So that when I'm praying with somebody or if they're praying for me and all of a sudden they begin just quietly, and by the way, when we talk about speaking in other languages and tongues in this church, the right way to do it is not to make a big show out of it. You know, the right way to do it is that it's not a show. Okay? But when I'm praying with somebody and they're praying for me with tongues or, or I'm praying in tongues for myself, my spirit is communicating something to God that my brain can't quite get. So the spirit of God brings unity in the midst of diversity, right? It's the Spirit's responsibility to bring unity to us in the midst of our diversity. And our responsibility is to make room for each other. The people sitting around you might not share your political views. They might not share your cultural understanding. They may not even speak the same language as you. They may not be the same age group. And they may not like the same kind of music that you do. But if you would not hold back, if you would open your heart up and allow the Spirit of God to work in you and the people around you, He can bring unity in the midst of our diversity. 
And that is what heaven is all about. Because in heaven, they're not going to have one heaven for white people and one heaven for Latinos. They're not. So why would we wait till then to be together? I need you here now in my life, right? That, that's a beautiful thing. That's, that's the message of Pentecost. Is it unstable? Yeah, it kind of is. You know? I mean, like, sometimes I'm like, it would be a lot easier to pastor if I only had to pastor people who thought and acted like me, right? Because I would know what they would need, and I would just give it to them. Is it unstable? Yes, absolutely. It's just as unstable as the Trinity is. How do you do that? You got three in one? How does that work? How do you get unity in the midst of diversity? It's just as unstable as, as the incarnation. Jesus is God and man. He's 100% God and 100% man. How is that possible? How do those two opposing forces meet and join together? That church is just as, as unstable as those things. All right. Together, unified, still ourselves, still unique, still diverse, but brought together under love by the Holy Spirit, if we will allow him to do it. If we will allow him to do it. That is my charge to you, people. Will you allow him to do it? Because there's certainly a lot of evidence that that's not always what we want. you know. And we say, actually, I, I want to go to a church where I don't have to listen to other cultural expressions because they make me uncomfortable. I can understand that, but at the same time, I want to push you that God made a beautiful creation. Right? And just because you like pine trees, that doesn't mean cedar trees aren't just as lovely <laughs> and important to this world. Okay? You with me on that? Yeah. I thought you would be. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. Now, Paul is going to give us some instruction in this. I'm grateful to God that um, he did let me keep the rest of my sermon here. So <laughs> we're going to go there. This is 1 Thessalonians in chapter 3, and we're going to cover verses 11 through 13. Um, and I want to read it, I want to read it, and then I'm going to talk about it. Because this is really, when Paul's talking here to the Thessalonians, he's really talking to them and giving them instruction about what I just described. Okay, if you remember, I, this is the, one of the first, probably the first letter, first book written in the New Testament. And it's written to a very, very new church. The church is only maybe a month, maybe two months old at this point. Um, so Paul is writing to a very young church that's just starting out under heavy persecution at the very, very beginning of our movement, the first thing that was written. So we're going to read 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 11 through 13. And I want you to read verse 12 with me, okay? So I'm going to read verses 11 and 13, and you guys read 12 with me. This is what it says. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ, clear the way for us to come to you. Now, let's all read verse 12 together. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. Okay, and I'll read verse 13. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Amen. Love, 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 love. Let's go back. To, I want to look at verse 12. That's where I'm going to spend the most of my time here. So if you just want to throw that up there and just leave it up there. There's something a bit cliche about Paul's words here, isn't it? So it's all love, right? In this modern world, love seems a very childish thing sometimes. Um, it's derided. It's been dissected on movie and TV screens, right? It's been reduced to an app right? Love is this, right? That's if you were under the age of 30, you would have got that, right? Love is this. <laughs> under the age of 40. Okay, I'll include myself in that. Um, <clears throat> love has been mocked in our schools. It's been neglected in our homes. Love seems cliche in this world. And religious people uh, who are meant to be the ones who express love the best, often are the ones failing in the most basic tests of love that we have in the world. And uh, it can be very discouraging when that happens. And this is why when God was among us, when God was walking among us, when Jesus was here walking uh, in the flesh around us, he got into such heated debates with religious people. 
Because people who are religious who know about God should know the most about love. But it ended up that they didn't. And some of them knew the least about love. Um, and so I want to go to just one more passage, and this is in Luke. Um, and you can turn there if you want, but I'll, I'm just going to read it to you. Um, this is in Luke 10, and, it, and it's a story about Jesus taking on some religious people. And, and Jesus is he's surrounded by some people that want to kind of test him with something. And they say to him, um, what's the greatest commandment? And uh, Jesus says, well, you guys know the commandments, and what do you, what do you think it is? And uh, the, the religious leader, he says, well, um, the greatest commandment is uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and your soul, and love your neighbors yourself. And Jesus says, you got it. That's it. Do that. You'll be fine. Uh, but the religious leader doesn't really know about love, right? He's talked about love, and he's read about love, and he's learned about love, but for some reason it hasn't quite gotten to the point where it's penetrated his heart. So he says to Jesus, well, who's my neighbor? Right? Because there's still some people I wouldn't like to love. <laughs> you know. So could you define that term for me? I mean, are we talking about immediate neighbors, right? I got two neighbors, one on either side. So that means them, and then that's it, right? Like, who are my neighbors? And in reply, Jesus tells a story. And I'm going to read this story that Jesus tells. It's a, it starts in verse 30. He says, a man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's a long journey there. And as he's going along... Uh, there's some robbers that, that come out and they, they grab him, you know, they take his stuff, they take his money, they beat him up, uh, and they leave him by the side of the road, you know, half dead, and they leave. And Jesus says what happens is, um, also going to Jerusalem is a priest, and the priest is coming down the road, and he, he sees the man who's beaten on the side of the road, and the priest thinks to himself, if I stop and help this guy, um, ritually it would mean I'm unclean and, and I'm not going to be able to go do my job in the temple. I'll have to wait seven days and get purified and blah, blah, blah. And it's just a hassle. And it's just more convenient for me to walk past this guy here. And so he does. So the guy who preaches on love on Sunday or Saturday walks past a guy dying on Monday or Sunday. Um, and a few moments later, says Jesus, there's a Levite who walks up. Now, Levites are also supposed to work in the temple. Okay? They also have a religious job. They've heard plenty of sermons. Okay? Um, and they walk past, and they see the guy there, and the Levite says, oh, shoot, you know, I am so busy right now. I just have a lot to do. And the guy looks like he's probably not going to make it anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, it could be a lot of, a lot of wasted effort. With this guy, I mean, I'd be honest with you. And there's other people that are hurt more or less. And uh, so the Levite says, I'm just going to pass by. And walks past him again. And finally says, Jesus, uh, a Samaritan walks up. Now, a Samaritan, I mean, he, a Samar I mean, really, a Samaritan. I mean, these people, you don't want to be around these people. You know, they're, they're wrong-headed. They're bigoted. They, they have terrible terrible ideas about the world. They're not the kind of people you would want around your children. You know, they're, they're going to teach your children wrong things. You know any Samaritans in this world? People that you would say, I don't want to be near that person. Uh, that is the kind of person that I would not want uh, to be in my sphere of influence, okay? They are outside of that, right? Um, and a, the Samaritan comes up and he sees the guy. He doesn't hesitate, Right? Gets off his donkey, grabs the guy, throws him up there, takes him to the nearest inn. He, he cleans him up, rubs oil on him, takes out his pocketbook, empties his pocketbook in front of the innkeeper and says, keep him for as long as you can. As long as this will buy, keep him. And if he needs anything else, he needs food, if he needs medical supplies, I'll be back in a week to check on him. I'll reimburse you for anything. I'm good for the money. Just look after him. Right? And Jesus asked the the religious leader, after he tells the story, he says, who do you think was a neighbor to the man who was beaten? And the religious leader's kind of caught, you know. He says, well, I guess the guy who helped them wouldn't even say the word Samaritan, right? Doesn't even want to let that word leave his, his lips. And Jesus says, yes, that's correct. Go and be like the Samaritan. Now, that's a wonderful story, and we've heard it a lot of times. But did you know, in the 70s, at Princeton, they tested this story out. 
Have you heard about this? There was a, they, were, they had a, um, they were doing, they were going to do a test. They were going to find out, will people help other people? So they went to Princeton Theological Seminary. It's a seminary at Princeton. And um, took some students who were seminary students. Uh, you know, did some measurements on them to find out if, you know, how religious they were and that kind of thing. And then they said to them, okay, um, there's a story in Luke 10. I want you to read it. They let them read the Good Samaritan. I want you to put together a brief presentation. And then I want you to go to the other side of campus and give that presentation to a group of folks who are waiting over there for you to give it to them. And... (laughs) You're running late. I took you too long to do these tests, so you really only have about 10 minutes to get over there, and it's the other side of campus. You've got to really hurry to get over there. So the student threw something together, rushed out the door, and as they're walking across campus, right, you can imagine, the the team of psychologists had planted someone on their path, right, who uh, was... uh, what, what the scenario was, was that there was a bike accident, okay? So they had a bike next to them, and they, were, they had some fake blood and bandages, and they were very obviously hurt, okay? And they wanted to see who was going to stop after having read the story of the Good Samaritan. Who was going to stop to help? And do you, you want to know how many people stopped? Not too many. If they told you you had time, to get across the campus, like, oh, don't worry, we got a half hour, presentations in a half hour, make your way over there. Uh, then about 60% of the people would stop and at least check on the person who was hurt. But if they told you, you don't have much time, you got to hustle, 30% of seminary students, having just read the story of the Good Samaritan, would stop and help the guy. 30%, that's one in three uh, would stop and help you. Some of them would literally step over the person who was on the ground on the way to the... Now, folks, I mean, I don't know much about Princeton, but if that's where our seminary students are at, we ain't got no hope for ourselves, am I right? <laughs> Love has got to increase among God's people. We've got to raise our game. And when Paul says in 1 uh, 1 Thessalonians 3.12, I pray that the love among you would increase and overflow, we need that message today. We need that message among us that the love would increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does, does for you. Folks, we've got to increase our love. It's got to overflow. The love that God has for this world is meant to increase in you and to overflow and to become abundant. And what does that mean? We're going to look at that. Number one, increase. Love's got to increase. Do you know what that means? It means that it's scalable. Love could be small or it could be large, but it's got to get bigger. It's got to increase. Okay, so I don't care how much love you have right now. What I'm interested in is, is it increasing? Is our love capacity increasing? Are there people in your mind that you think, I would love them and them and them and them and probably everybody in this room, but those people, not so much, right? Our love has got to increase. Did you know what? God loves a Black Lives Matter protester as much as God loves a Proud Boy protester. Did you know that? Now, that's a scary thought because some people in this room don't like one or the other, and I understand that. Your love has got to increase. Your love has got to increase. And it doesn't just increase. It's got to overflow. That means it's not containable. That means it's not restrictable. That means that the love that God has for us has got to bubble over, right? Outside of our boxes. Outside of our ideals. And into something exuberant. Abundant. Excessive. Is there a limit to our love? There shouldn't be. I agree with you there. Is there a limit to our love? It must increase. It must overflow. So we need to be honest before God. In this moment here, in this place, yes, I'm asking you to literally be honest before God. Because it's God who increases and overflows our love, right? May the Lord make your love increase and overflow. 
May the Lord make your love increase and overflow. But what I've noticed is just because God can do that doesn't mean that he will do that if I am not willing to allow him to do that. If I think my love is just fine and dandy right where it is, God's not going to force his way into my heart and say, no, I'm pumping you full of more love. It's only when I can say honestly before God, I admit to you that there are limits on my love. I admit to you that my love is smaller than it should be. And I need you to please come and increase my love. The, those moments, now here, now here's an open door. And be prepared because God will increase his love in your heart. And maybe it might be forcing you into situations where you're encountering people who are difficult to love. Or beyond your capability of loving. And then the question is, will you allow the Holy Spirit to create the sort of community that you need? Or will you resist him? This is the story of Pentecost. This is the story of Thessalonians. This love is supernatural. This love is beyond nature. This love is not normal. In normal human society, these people don't gather together. In normal human society, diversity makes us sequester away, guard ourselves. This love is not natural to us, but it is available to us. If we will let it in, it is available to us. I want to invite the worship team to come on up. We're going to take communion together. <clears throat> and as we're preparing ourselves for that, our hearts for that. I was thinking about this hymn. Could we with ink the oceans fill? Do you know this one? Not you specifically, but them. Oh, I love oceans. That's my favorite. And were the skies of parchment made, and every stock on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above, would drain the oceans dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. This is the limitless love of God. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. In verse 13, Paul finishes this chapter, he says, may he strengthen your heart so that you may be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Friends, it's not something you have to fake it till you make it. It's not something you have to create in and of yourself. It's not something you have to conjure up. This love is a real love. This God is a real God. And uh, so I want to ask Christy uh, and Rachel, would you guys mind just pulling that table and bringing it right over here? And I want to ask you this morning, where is your heart? Where is it? I can't tell. I don't know who you are. I can't read your mind or listen to your heartbeat. But where is your heart before God today? Do you need access to some limitless love? Do you realize maybe coming to terms with the fact that there's some limits on your love? Today is a good day to say, Lord, Fill my heart with your love because God loves you so much. Oh, friends, his love for you is limitless. There is nothing you could do or will do or in any circumstance to separate yourself from God's love. His love for you is, is beyond competition. There's no rival to it. There's nothing inside of you that can compete with it. There's nothing inside of you that can stop it. The question is not, does God love you? The question is, will you accept it or not? The question is not, is God's love able to overcome the things I have done? The question is, will I allow him to overcome it in my heart? And so that's the question I have for you today. Communion is the right time to think over that. Because this describes for us an example of God's love. That when Jesus came, and it says that he was sitting with his disciples. 
and they were having food together and he took some bread and he broke it and he said, friends, I want you to know that my body is broken for you. My love causes my body to be broken for you. I can't even hold on to it. And then Jesus says, look at this wine. This is, this is like my blood that's been poured out for you. Everything I have, if I could give it, I would. Everything I am, I'm going to pour out for you. It's a limitless love. And so this morning, we have some examples of this. And when, when, we, when I, I'm going to pray for it, I'm going to invite you to come up, as you will, as you feel led to come up and take one of these. There are that say gluten-free on the top. If you're not gluten-free, try to grab the ones that are not gluten-free. But as you take it, take it back to your seats, and I want you to find somebody else. Because you know what? Sometimes we can believe that love by ourselves, but when we're telling another person, it becomes richer. And I want you to take this communion and I want you to share it with at least one other person around you. As you're taking it together, you're eating the little cracker and you're drinking this juice, I want you to remind that person, Jesus loves you. God loves you. I want you to share that with some other other person here needs to hear that. Maybe you're the one who needs to hear it, but you know what? You're going to tell it to the person next to you. And they're going to tell it to you. Let me pray for us. And then I want to invite you to come up. Take communion back to your seats and take it with somebody else as we sing our last song. Lord, we come before you today. Before the God whose love for us is uncontainable. Whose love towards us is inexpressible. Lord, would you increase and overflow our love for each other. And I pray this morning as we take these communion elements that we would be reminded of the love of God. Would you come and take this this morning? You were near Though I was distant With disillusion I was lost and insecure Still mercy falls
Dear brothers and sisters, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. And may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. This morning, Lord, we receive your word. We receive your spirit. We say, come. Come, Lord Jesus. Fill our hearts. Fill our world. May the grace of God, may the peace brought by his Son, May the holy presence of his Holy Spirit be with you, guiding you, working alongside of you, blessing you, filling you up. In his holy and precious name, to him be all the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It is so wonderful to see all of you. Tonight at 6 o'clock, we have a Pentecost service. You're very welcome to come to. God bless you. We'll see you tonight.